Good morning. I've been speaking to you over this month about the United States of America. It's like a patriotic month, uh, starting with the very first day. But we're going to continue on this theme, and it's going to be a little bit about America, but it's also about Israel, and it's also about your family. The title of this message is Your Inheritance River. From the very beginning of our worship time today, the very first line was a call to get into the river. Yeah, and I noticed that Tony led us. I had no idea what the song selection was going to be, but that she led us in songs about getting into the river. And I, even when she exhorted, she said, it's time for you to get into the river. Well, I want you to know that this river is a kingdom of God river. It is actually your inheritance river. If you understand that salvation is just the beginning, for it's a call for you to enter into something that is bigger than the world. This is the kingdom of God. It goes from one end of the universe to the other. Its leader and maker is God Almighty himself. Its champion is Jesus Christ, his son. And every man and woman of God who has come late or come early, who has come from generations or has just lately been adopted, has been called to be part of the great family of God. But this family of God is bigger and better than your own family because this is God's family and your family should be a part of his family. But this is your inheritance. It's what you have been called to. Uh, we're going to look into Joshua chapter 14, but I want to say before we get into Joshua 14, 6, that 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says this, For this reason you have been called, that you might inherit, would you say the word inherit? That you might inherit a blessing. Because this isn't just a blessing that you get. This is something that is going to come to you uh, from the Father above. Once you step into this, it is so big, it is like a river. It is like you're in the desert. You've come from a strange place. Everything is dry. No trees are growing. And all of a sudden, you look over the edge, and there's the Grand Canyon with a huge, gushing, torrential river rushing through it. And that's what you've got to find and that's what you've got to step into and when you do everything about your life will change and the direction of your future will change and the blessings of God will come on you so powerfully that you'll be fit to be tied and want to have kittens you will be so excited that you'll want to dance and laugh and you will say, how could this happen to me? A poor person, a rejected person, a lost person, a lonely person, somebody who has been out there in the fringes and beyond, in no man's land with no hope and no success and only drudgery and pain and even some abuse. And yet here you are today, ready to step into something that is the divine purpose predestined, organized, sovereign blessing of God for your life. And this is your inheritance. It's what Jesus died on the cross for you to come into. It's called the glory of the Lord. It's better than the glory that you get when you get goosebumps or even have some special uh, manifestations in a church service. This is the glory of the Lord that covers the earth like the waters cover the sea and you've been invited to the party. I don't want you to miss this river. I don't want you to be hopping around and trying to find something on your own because you cannot create this river you cannot make your own ministry. You cannot create your own design. You have to get into the river of God where the blessing is unstoppable and it overflows so powerfully and it takes you in a place where you can't touch the bottom and you can't touch the shores, but you're in the refreshing, glorifying power of the living God. So hallelujah. I want to speak to you about this today. So would you open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 14, and we're going to read about an old man. Well, some people wouldn't say he's old, but he's 85, so you can determine whether that's old or young. One day, if you're 85 years of age, you'll be called a kid. 
And those of you who might be 85 years of age who are here, you might still feel you are a kid. But in the millennium, the Bible says if somebody dies at the age of 100, they'll say he must have been cursed because he was just a youth. Because everyone there lives till a thousand and then into eternity and beyond. So we look at Joshua chapter 14 and verse 6. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Canaanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me, about Joshua and Caleb. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord with my, my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, he promised me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord now, this is 40 years later, and he is now 85 years of age, 45 years later. And now, just as the Lord promised, Caleb said, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. Say hallelujah. I'm just as vigorous. Ooh, I like it when people are vigorous. I'm just as vigorous to go to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day, 45 years ago. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. All right, now let's pray. Lord, we welcome. We welcome the word of the Lord, the increased power of the Holy Spirit. We're on the very verge, Lord. We're on the precipice looking over the edge of the canyon at the river. Some are in the river, but some are still needing to get down the canyon floor and to get into the water. Lord, we don't want to be running across the desert trying to find a little oasis. We want to get in the river. We speak your blessing today and we receive the inheritance that has been promised us. We speak it forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this huge river is not just something you get into because you're saved. It's not something that you get into just because you sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. This is something that is organic, it's dynamic, it has to do with fivefold ministry, it has to do with the government of God, it has to do with you finding your place of joining and getting your feet into that place. It is a journey that you go on until you find the goal at the other side of the rainbow where you say, this is it, this is your kingdom, this is your government, this is your purpose. I am not going to miss it. Come hell or high water or any kind of political 
political opposition or whatever takes place with wars and rumors of wars or earthquakes, nothing is going to separate me from my inheritance in the land of God, in the promised land. But you cannot find this yourself. There has to be a family. You've got to be connected to have an inheritance. I did a little research and found out there's only four main rivers in the land of Israel. And one of them, of course, is the Jordan. And another one just comes out of the, the country of Jordan and just is in Israel for a short time before it becomes part of the Jordan River. Another one, if you've come with us to Israel to Mount, uh, the Mount Carmel and you've looked down into the Valley of Armageddon, you'll see a little trickle of a river there called the Kidron. And then there's one fourth. There's a fourth one that comes that goes out into the Mediterranean. There's very few rivers in Israel. All the others are really just water rush-offs that are temporary and they come after a rain. And they just go along and then they dry up and they're not really a river. And there is not a lot of rivers where this kind of move of the Holy Spirit and this kind of apostolic call and the government of God is moving on the earth. When you see it, you need to understand that it's something that's come about generationally. It's not something that came as a flash in the pan or something, you know, the flash in the pans are like those rivers that don't remain rivers. They're just a stream that comes in the rainy season, but after a time, 10, 20 years, they're all gone. And sometimes it's two years. But there are generations of people. Do you know that Bill Johnson, who now is the senior pastor of Bethel Church, his children are sixth-generation ministers. He didn't just all of a sudden say, I'm Johnson, I am uh, Bill Johnson, and I am going to make something great. No, actually, he took over his father's church. And there's a generational blessing of building and integrity and the raising up of ministries and the fortifying of the people of God. And there's a river that we know that comes out from that church that's blessing the whole world. I've never met him, but I appreciate him. And there's a river that comes through the whole world because of him. And then because of all those who are part of him. And there are tributaries and loads of ministries going in every direction. And he probably has a hard time knowing all of the activity, and he doesn't know all the activity of spiritual ministry that takes place uh, under his care because it's too massive and too big. But it hasn't come because of lone rangers or people who are just opportunists. It's people who have said, I'm going to hitch my wagon to that star. Because I see the government of God and the purpose of God. And if all your journeys across the earth, if you find the people of God that are moving in the purpose of God, they're not playing church. They're not just having a, a nice religious country club. But they're serious about the world, that this is my father's world. They're serious about evangelism and seeing souls saved. They're serious about hearing the prophetic word of the Lord and praying in step with God and sending out missionaries and blessing Israel and loving to worship and adore the King of Kings and preaching the word of God with courageous strength. When you see this, and you see that those people are not just proud, arrogant, don't touch me, kind of live in ivory tower people, but those are people who have become family, like bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. We are the people of God. Once we were not the people of God, but now we are the people of God. And once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. And when you see that, and you see the government of God, and you see a reformation at work and you start to see revival bubbling up you say I want to be part of that and I will grow there I will plant my feet there I will see another another tributary come in and I will bless what God is doing on the earth and when you do that you will receive 
an inheritance. See, Caleb and Joshua here are going to receive an inheritance that comes from Moses. God promised to Moses, let my people go and bring them into the promised land that I will give to you and the descendants of Abraham. God gave the word to Moses and then he led the charge and everybody that got connected with Moses, let me tell you, they were all slaves. They were all in Egypt under the taskmaster's whip. They were all under the tyranny of Pharaoh. But they became part of the great family of God because they found Father Moses and God had ordered Father Moses to do certain things that was uh, extensive. It was catastrophic. It was taking two million people out of their homes with children and moving them into the desert and taking them to a promised land. And there were so many people who had different ideas of what church life under Moses was going to be all about. And some of them said, I'll see. And after three days out in, into the desert, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They missed the onions and leeks. You can tell they were from the Mediterranean. They missed, obviously, their falafel. And, um, you know, the hummus and all the good stuff. They missed it. They wanted to go back. And... Um, God said to Moses, just keep going forward. And he had a horrible time trying to pastor that crowd of people because there were so many complainers. And because of their complaining and their negative hearts, it took 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that should have only taken 40 days. And 40 years later, these two adopted spiritual sons step up to the borders of the promised land. Moses himself doesn't go in. But the millions of Israelites go in. Under the leadership of these two. Joshua and Caleb. And five years after they get into the land. Caleb is now 85 years of age. And he's still fighting. He's fighting for his inheritance. See nobody gets into the family of God except you get chosen. You have to be adopted. It's not that you're born as a little baby into the family of God. You have to be called, you have to be chosen, and you have to be adopted. With a spirit of adoption has to come upon you. And then you become part of the family of God. You should find a father. You should find mothers. You should find brothers and sisters. You should find children. You should see yourself as part of the community of the redeemed. And you should be a part of that for positive, faithful strength. And if you have found the government of God in your area, whatever church you come from, if you have found that, there will be increase. There will be love. There will be wisdom. There will be power. There will be the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There will be deliverance. There will be healings. There will be intercessory prayer. It will be so much going on that you cannot visit and be a part of it all. You will find your place in it and just love it because this is the kingdom of God. So I want to ask you, and please don't answer out loud because the person beside you might not have worked it out yet and they might feel embarrassed. But have you found, have you found this inheritance river? Because you will get saved, fine, all by yourself in Jesus. But you will not get this inheritance river unless you come to his government. Because it's not just about Jesus, it's about his people as well. And I want to show you a little bit about something that uh, was a surprise to me. Because I didn't know that in 1995, how many years ago was that? 23 years ago, Derek Prince, my grandfather, how many of you have heard of him before? Just let me know, okay, so, yeah, you're saved. Yeah, so, <laughs> he was celebrating his 50th year in the ministry 23 years ago. We were ministering up in Canada, and we came down for Grandpa's service of dedication 
and celebration of 50 years in the ministry. We came down here. Morningstar was not in their building yet. In fact, I had lunch that day with Rick Joyner, just he and I. And he talked to me about the Comenius School and what he was planning to do for that. And it was after that that they actually got that building. And I didn't know. I didn't know where it was. I knew it was in these buildings. But I didn't know that it was this building where we celebrated my grandfather's 50th years in the ministry. And Derek Prince preached from this pulpit, from this platform, on this thrust, and laid his hands on me and released a mantle over my life for the ministry at the same place where we now have this church building and have this pulpit. And I preach here to you every Sunday. This is called the fingerprints of God and the inheritance. My grandchildren are fifth generation ministers. And on both sides, on my mother's side and my father's side. Pastor Elizabeth there and Pastor Matthew over there in the sound booth uh, are fourth generation ministers of the gospel. Yeah. So it's amazing. Now I want to show you some pictures of this. Now these pictures were, I didn't even know it was this building until one month ago. Yeah, there we are. And that's Grandpa Derek and Ruth in the background. And this is our thrust right here. I was a shock because actually Joy, my wife, was doing spring cleaning and she got out this box and there was stuff and she wants to throw away everything we don't need. And uh, I like to say, well, we might need it, you know. That's, that's two different halves of the picture. And I said, let me look through all these photos. And there was my dad's photo album and I hadn't seen these photos before. And I looked and I said, hey, that was the 50th anniversary of Grandpa Derek. And we were there with our kids when they were little. And it's in our building. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, so let's look at the next picture here. There's Grandpa Derek and Ruth preaching from right here. All right, 23 years ago. Uh, please give us the next picture. Now, just stop here for a second. You see that beautiful young lady with the white and kind of, uh, is that a tunic dress? What, it's the gray, yeah, the white shirt and the gray dress in front. That's Pastor Elizabeth right there with the bun up on her head. Yeah, and that's my mother beside her. And just behind my mother is yours truly. Yeah. And there's Grandpa Derek with the plaque that he received that day. And you see way over the very furthest person with the nice shaggy mop of hair, that's Matthew. All right, let's look at the next picture here. Now here is our family and uh, with Derek and Ruth. And um, you see that guy with the white shirt and his hand in his pocket looking super cool? That's Matt. And just in front of him is myself. And there's my mother beside me, and that's, those are members of our family on this stage, praying like we do every Sunday when we send out missionaries. Isn't this incredible? Let's look at another picture. And here they are, sitting right here. The children are sitting here, being prayed over and blessed. And uh, there's Elizabeth in the very back of that group that's sitting down. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's our gang of kids. All right, next picture, please. Now, you see the gentleman here in the black suit and the, the glasses? That's my dad. And he's out in the front here doing a Jewish dance with all the kids. Yeah, well, David's his son. Yeah, and there in the background is... Elizabeth and Matthew in that dance circle with their grandpa, my dad, dancing right here 23 years ago. Can we have the next picture? And here we are. There's Elizabeth again. She gets in every picture. Do you notice that? 
<clears throat> and behind her is myself, and we're, there's my mom right there hugging Grandpa Derek, and she's gone to be with the Lord. Her name is Magdalene Katz from the tribe of Levi. Next picture, that's it. All right, praise God. Thank you, Luke. So I wanted to show you that because things don't happen in a vacuum with God. He has these plans and his fingerprints are on our lives when we don't even know what's going on. We don't even know. In fact, it may take us 25 years to catch up with something and to say, hey, hey, that connects with that and that connects with that. Now, I need to tell you about my mom because if not for my mom, there wouldn't be this family. You know that there were nine girls that Derek and Lydia adopted. One was a black African girl. I have an aunt who's as dark-skinned as any person in this room. And my other aunts are either Jewish or they're Arab. My mother's Jewish. Nine girls in all. My mother was born in Tel Aviv. And her birth was highly suspicious. We have her mother's name on the birth certificate, but not a father. And she was brought by the rabbi to Ramallah, to an Arab town where my grandmother, of course I wasn't born yet, where she was caring for little children and preaching to Arab ladies in Israel. And she ended up helping 80 kids over the next 10 years. Kind of an in-house orphanage that she had. And she adopted several of them. My mother was the, the fifth child to come. And she came when she was five days old. I have her birth certificate. Born in Tel Aviv. No doubt she was almost dead when Lydia took her in. Because this rabbi just came to the door and threw the baby into Lydia's hands. Because Jewish people don't give their babies over to Gentiles. But the circumstances which we don't know about must have been so difficult about this baby's life. And the shame it might have brought on the family. That for this reason or some other, she just got plunked into the hands of Lydia. Who had a one room little house with a concrete floor, a pump for water out in the courtyard in front and an outhouse at the back and she had opened up her suitcase and put a baby in the suitcase and used even her, her clothes as blankets. She only had a bed, a chair, and a dresser in that room and she was a single lady, Lydia Christensen at the time, and she went there by faith. So, the later Derek came and they adopted nine of these girls. And my mom was 15 years of age when the flag went up and Israel became a nation. Then they had to flee for their lives because of the war of independence that broke out. And they almost were killed several times. And so my mother is really a refugee, a Jewish refugee, who was rescued from the land of hostility and war by two Europeans, Derek and Lydia Prince. When they got to England, they married my dad, who was a preacher of great faith, who sat under Smith Wrigglesworth and was an amazing man of God. And these two families, my dad born in China on the mission field, brought to England. Derek Prince comes, starts a church north of London, and my dad becomes his assistant pastor. He marries my mom, and I become the firstborn of the Jewish family, the Jewish mama. Hmm. So I hope you can see that it doesn't matter where you're coming from or how bad your situation has been 
or how close to death you might have come, or how ripped apart and how tattered your life might look at this time. If you get into the river of God, the river of God's inheritance, you go from something that is empty and dead and hopeless into something that's full of life, but more than life. It's full of the glory. It's full of the abundance. It's full of the power. It's full of the government of God for your life. When I was a young man in the ministry, I said the most important thing, you know, I was already saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and preaching every Sunday. I said the most important thing is that I find the government of God on the earth, at least a part of it, and I get connected because I know that's the river of my inheritance. Hmm. So here you are. You may not be called to Antioch International Church. It's not my place to pull you in either. But you better be pulled in somewhere. And you better find a papa and a father. You better find a Moses. And you better be part of a river. Because we're not going to have reformation in the United States of America. And we're not going to have the revivals that we need unless the kingdom of God rises up and we see ourselves as part of a great family of God, and we find our place. And we're not just opportunists who are running here and there for the finest meal, but we're people who are connecting and being cemented together in the power of the Holy Spirit for the government of God and for the glory of Jesus. And the Lord will honor that, and he'll bless all who are a part of that. So here we are. This isn't just about my family. It's about Israel. Israel has this promise over the land of Israel and over the people of Israel that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be lifted higher than all the other mountains. And people from all the nations will stream unto that place. And they will come to worship the Lord God Almighty. And he will teach us his ways. And he will call us to take all of our weapons of warfare and melt them down into agricultural implements. And there will be no war on the earth anymore. And there will be one name, and his name is Jesus Christ over the whole earth. But this happens in Israel. Israel is not like any other nation, for God has chosen this. They're called the chosen people. That's the chosen land. It's the promised land, and it's the place of God's government. It's where his headquarters will be. So that's why the Bible says that the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. And that's why the Bible says, if I don't make Jerusalem my highest joy, let my right hand lose its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I don't make Jerusalem my highest joy. Because that's his government. That's his place. That's where King of Kings is going to sit on the throne and rule the nations. And that's why we have to be in partnership with what God is doing in Israel today. So Israel is not where it needs to be, but let's face it, the church is really messed up too. And most people who call themselves Christians around the world might not even be born again. So it's easy for us to point a finger, but we need to look at our own front door. And there's going to be a restoration in the church, and there's going to be a restoration in Israel. It's in the Bible, and Jesus will have the last word. And you will see this for some of you, in your lifetime. This is a time of restoration. And there will be an inheritance that comes to the people of Israel. Listen, God has enough inheritance to go around. Don't feel you're going to miss out if you jump into the river of God's purpose and you do everything that God calls you to do. Let me point you in one other direction, and that's the United States of America. This nation, this end-time nation, this is God's end-time nation. This nation was founded for godly principles, to be based on godly principles, to be a Christian nation. 
It has the purpose of blessing and supporting Israel. It has the purpose by God of being missionaries to the world. It has the purpose by God of breaking tyranny around the world. It has the purpose by God of feeding the hungry and the poor and giving homes to those who don't have it around the world. This is God's end time nation. And in the times to come, it will partner with redeemed Israel and see this world turned upside down for revival. As the church goes in America, so it will go around the world. Now, prophetic word today from Pastor Chuck uh, that God's working through this imperfect man named Donald Trump. But it's really about the church. I thought that was profound when he said, this is really about the church. You might think this is about just this nation and us uh, turning such horrible things like abortion around and standing with Israel and supporting the family. But it's really, I think, a wake-up call to the church. And that's the hour we are in right now. The call for intercessors, the call for holiness is right here in our hearing today. So this nation is going to come into its inheritance. The heyday for America is coming. Get ready to dance in the streets. Get ready to have church at the supermarket. Yeah. Get ready for the love of the Lord to spread across this nation. Don't think that there won't be battle and enemies everywhere there's battle and enemies. But watch what God is going to do. And it has to do with him releasing his promised inheritance. So now let's go back to the story of Caleb, now that I've given you an introduction. Because Caleb is 40 years of age. Some would say his life is half over. But obviously it wasn't yet. But we call that midlife. And a lot of you might be having a midlife crisis. Some people are 20 and are having a midlife crisis already. <laughs> and some people are 65 and just waking up to life and they're having a midlife crisis. Yeah. The midlife crisis is when you get to a certain place in your life when you just come to the realization that you're not going to ever be or do the things that you always thought you would do and be. And then you've got to deal with it. And you've got to say, so then what is my life about? And some people go into a deep depression because they think it's not about anything anymore. But wake up! Wake up and get in the river! This man, Caleb, was 85. Now, he was a patient man. He hooked his wagon to Father Moses because he said that's the government of God. And the Bible says that he was there. But not only that, he was so extraordinary in his life and his attitudes. And he wasn't a complainer. And he wasn't, uh, you know, nitpicking at things. And he wasn't jealous. He, he was a man of God. No matter where you come from, you cannot use that as an excuse. God will not allow you to say, well, it was because of my dad that I turned out to be such a mess. It was because of the way my mom abandoned us that I turned out to be such a mess. Oh no, today you choose your life. I understand there's a need for healing, but Jesus will heal you. But listen, everybody in the whole world is fighting some battle somewhere. Everybody. So don't let the battle pull you back, slow you down, or stop you from getting the inheritance. It's up to you whether you're grumpy or happy. I want you to know that I'm always happy, even when I'm not. I got this little boy inside of me jumping up and down saying, glory to God, glory to God. Even when you might not see it on the outside. And I refuse to live in an old man's rubble. I refuse it. I refuse to be a victim because my life is called of God. 
So, as a young man, I said, I've got to find the government of God because I know that's where the blessing comes. I can't make it myself. Promotion doesn't come from the north or the south or the east or the west. Promotion comes from the Lord. And you get into this river and you can have the joy of the Lord. You can have your cake and eat it too. But you will get a little fat. So, here's Caleb. For these 40 years, he sticks with Pastor Moses. Yeah. Because, I'll tell you why. There was no other game in town. And that's it. It didn't matter about the music. It didn't matter about the facility. It didn't matter about strobe lights and fake smoke in the background. It didn't matter about cool and satisfying millennials. It was about the government of God. And when you see the government of God, that's it. That's it. And there's many fathers in this region who bring the government of God. And I'm thankful for them all. And across this nation. But many streams make glad the city of Zion. Many tributaries make the river. Ha. Huh. But if you go from this church to that church to that church to that church, at the end, you won't have a church. You'll just be a visitor. And that's not a place of the greatest blessings. You might get the overflow, but you are not going to be promoted into the kingdom because there's a catapult revival coming and it's going to come to those who have been equipped, those who have been faithful, those who have proven themselves just like Caleb. And it starts because of Moses. There's a generational blessing that you can get adopted into. Yeah. So let's look at this man, Caleb. And I'm going to give you seven things about his life. All right? So this is about you and your inheritance river. What he did is what you have to do. So the first thing is you have to find a father figure in your life who is a real supernatural Holy Spirit, kingdom of God, government ordained apostle. You have to find that. And it doesn't have to be me. I'm very happy for you to go and find a different papa. But you have to find one. And just like Caleb did. And then he had to be very patient because it was 40 years of hanging around with those nasty church people. <laughs> who, many of them just didn't get it. In fact, a whole generation had to die. Oh God, don't let a whole generation at Antioch have to, have to die before we can go into the promised land. Let that not happen. But, but if we mess around and play around, if we play church, if we look at personal ambition, which Derek Prince says is the worst enemy of the church, personal ambition, if we look at that, we will not get the kingdom of God and it will have to go to our children if we don't lose them. Do you understand? This is generational and it's serious. All of my grandchildren are serving the Lord. All of my children are either in full-time ministry or serving the Lord as if they were. And this is for you. This is not a judgment thing. This is calling you, calling you to enter into this inheritance river. It's yours for the taking. But my goodness, it is painful. So Caleb went through the desert. For 40 years. Secondly, Caleb refused to hold back. He was chosen 
for, for his tribe as one of the 12. You know, Moses chose one person from each tribe. You know how many people were in his tribe? 30,000. And he got chosen from among 30,000 to be one of these spies. And he went into the promised land and he came back and he said, yeah, all of these things are true. There are giants, there are great walled cities, but God has spoken. Let's go and take the land. It's ours for the taking. He would not be held back. He was courageous and fearless. And you have to be the same. If you want God's inheritance for your life, you got to go for it. Amen. There's a time and a moment when you've got to go for it with all of your heart. And you go for it. And I will cheer you on. I might have to catch you, but I'll cheer you on. The third thing is that Caleb loved the Lord with all of his heart. It says it three times in this scripture. And Caleb loved the Lord with all of his heart. Now, your first allegiance is certainly not to me, but it is to him. It's to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is your Savior. He is your Master. He is your Lord. He is the one who directs you. I'm a helper. I'm a little servant who works for him to help you on your journey. But he's the one you look to. If you can look at me and see him, that's a bonus. Whew. I want to grab you all in a big bear hug and carry you into the purpose of God. You know where I'm going to put you? In a river. I'll put you in a You can say, I can't swim. It's okay. It's supernatural water. You, you can walk on this water, but you won't want to because you want to get wet. Yeah. So, don't hold back and love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And this has to do with holiness and purity. Integrity is when no matter how deep they cut, they get the same thing on the inside as they see on the outside. I'm happy when people come to our home because I don't live a different life there than I do when I'm here. And I don't want to. When I say I love my wife, I really do love her. So... You love the Lord with all of your heart. And there's so many prophetic words and revelations. People up in the middle of the night, even last night, several of you told me that you were up at 2 or 3 in the morning and had just such a great time with the Lord. I know. You just love the Lord with all of your heart. I am so proud of you people and the love for the Lord that you have. It's the foundation of our future. But it was the foundation 3,000 years ago with this man named Caleb. And the fourth thing is that Caleb had great faith. So you have to. You've got to have real... You know what? Faith is courage. Faith is hearing God and then having the courage to do it. I said to somebody that I went out for breakfast with today, I said, I'm going to preach what God gives me. I'll be as nice as I can. But I'm going to preach what God gives me even if the church empties. Yeah, I'm telling you. Because while I serve you, I really serve him. And I would rather be in favor with God than with the multitude of people. But having said that, I'm not a legalistic, heavy-handed micromanager. I am not that guy. And I don't like that guy. And if you're one of our leaders and you are like that, if you are tight-shirted, critical, bossy, pushing people around, you and I have to have a meeting and I'm going to minister deliverance. Because <laughs> that is not Jesus. So, you've got to have great faith. Having said that, you have to have great faith. You've got to be ready to go to the edge of the Grand Canyon and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when he says, jump, you've got to say, Lord, 
I think you said jump. I'm sure that wasn't you. Will you tell me again if that's you and you hear jump and you say, no, 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 no. That's a mile down. I am not a bird. I cannot jump. That must be from the devil. I rebuke you, devil. But if it's you, Lord, you tell me. And then he says, Peter, jump! Ha. Huh. I say, all right. If I die, it's your fault. <laughs> now listen, I have said those words to God. I said, you've spoken to me. I believe you've spoken to me. I'm going to obey you. It doesn't make sense to me. It's bigger than me. I can't do it. But because I know you said it, I'm going to do it. And if I die, it's your fault. And I've jumped. And every time I have jumped, I have landed into the providence and the provision for promotion. But that's faith. Based on the word of God, that's faith. Number five, Caleb was determined to fight. Now this here might be a little bit strange to you because you might say, I don't want to fight. I want peace. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. Oh no. You need to rejoice and go to war. Yeah. You need to have this attitude in you. See, Caleb said, I want the land that was promised to me 45 years ago that Moses, my father, promised me and that God promised me as my inheritance. Say inheritance. inheritance. Yeah. So then he said, now I know that there's enemies in the land and there's big cities in the land, but I am as strong today as I was 45 years ago. I'm vigorous. And I'm ready to go to battle. And he does. He does at 85 years of age. And he goes and takes the land of Hebron as an inheritance. So you have to have this fight in you. I don't fight for something that you're not supposed to. But you fight for that which is the kingdom of God. And you fight for your inheritance. And don't let it go. It's all right. You'll be fine. I've got only two more things. Number six, Caleb always looked for a better future. Always. Even in the desert, even in the time of monotony for 40 years, he always, he never lost sight of the prize and the purpose of God for his life or for the people of Israel. I am always looking to the future. I know about some of it because I've received hundreds of prophetic words. And I know because God has spoken to me about my future to a degree. And I'm always looking for those things. Every step that I take in my life aims towards that future of blessing. And you have to do that for your life. Now lastly, Caleb blessed the next generation. He got his inheritance. He went and fought the battle to get it. It didn't come easily. He had to go after it himself, but it was based on the word of the Lord. And when he got it, he passed it on. So turn over the next page in Joshua chapter 15, verse 16. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures these bad guys. Kiriath Sefer. And 17, verse 17. Othaniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother, Kenaz is K 
Caleb's brother, and his son is Othaniel, took the city. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. Verse 18. One day, when she came to Othana, her husband, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And when she had got off her donkey, Caleb was there, her dad. And Caleb said, what can I do for you, daughter? And she said, do me a special favor. Since you have given me land in the Negev, which is in the desert, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her her inheritance. Caleb gave her the upper and the lower springs of that piece of land. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Judah. And that goes on to explain more detail. So, this is your journey. It's not just Caleb's journey. It has to do with the river of your inheritance. That's the goal for your life. That's where you've got to find it. You've got to get into it. And once you're in this river, don't get out for sunbathing. Don't get out to find another river unless God speaks to you like that. And he does. And then you follow what he says. But when you find the river, you jump in and you say, thank you, God. And then you will be changed. The river will change you. It will change your doctrine. Tweak it. Not the basics, but some things where you messed up. And it will equip you. It will increase your faith. It will make you belong. It will give you a father. It will give you mothers. It will give you brothers and sisters and children to care for. It will give you purpose and direction and the flow of the Holy Spirit. It will fill you with the goodness and the glory of the Lord. And you will be glad to go up to the house of the Lord, the people of God, when they congregate. And that's where the inheritance will be. Caleb got in that river 45 years before this story. And here it is, his life. You might say, well, he didn't get to enjoy it for very long. I always say that about myself. By the time I get to everything that God has for me to do, well, it probably won't be because there'll be always something else. But I'll be ancient. And then what? Well, then I'll go to be with him and he'll say to me, well done. Amen. And whatever I have done, I will give to my children. Not just my physical children, but my spiritual children. And it will be so much bigger and so much more filled with the glory and the goodness of God. So don't go running through the desert looking for a little oasis where you can sit under a palm tree with a coconut in the middle of the desert. Go to the river and find the glory of God. So that your children can be blessed. This is about your children. And your children's children. If the Lord tarries so long. So this is the. Your inheritance river. If you found it. You are blessed. Most Christians have not. But encourage them. Preach the, this gospel of the kingdom. Not just this gospel of salvation. That's just the beginning. Hmm. Can you say amen? amen? Would you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray over you and pray with you. And when we're finished, if you would like prayer, we're going to invite you up here for prayer. But right now, I want you just to come into the prayer of agreement. Ooh, there's a river that's coming to the United States of America. 
And it's not just a bless me thing, and it's not just a thing of people getting saved. Those are part of it, but it's much bigger than that. It's thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And wherever the kingdom of God comes, it brings prosperity in body, in soul, in finances, in the spirit. It is so attractive and so dynamic. And one day the whole world will be filled with this anointing, this river of God that gushes out from under his throne will cover the whole earth. Now put your hands out in front of you and would you pray, say, Heavenly Father, Thank you for saving me. Forgive me of my sins, my wrongdoing, that which I have done. I admit and I repent of it. I ask you to wash me now with the blood of the Lamb, the precious blood of Jesus. And forgive me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive your goodness and your power in my life and today I willfully embrace the kingdom of God in my life no longer will I be a foreigner or a stranger or a wanderer but I am with the people of God under the government of God for the purpose of God I receive your blessing I jump into the river with faith for your goodness to flow and let this river cover the whole earth and let there be revival in the United States of America and in Israel and in the nations. We pray it together in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now put your hand on your heart. Would the prayer ministry team please come forward? And after I pray with you and dismiss you, then if you would like additional prayer, please come forward. So would the prayer ministry team come? All right. Now I'm just going to bless you now. First, I just open the heavens over you for the unstoppable, unmeasurable release of God's love over you. For his mercy and his goodness and his compassion to be upon you. I speak the opening of your ears for the hearing of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I pull every arrow and every hurt and every judgment against you. I break its power and I speak new days for you now. I open the doors for your future. And I speak the joy of the Lord into you and the peace of God in your home, the blessings of God on your life and on your marriage and on your children and your children's children and your great-grandchildren. And I release to you the beginnings of a whole new understanding of your inheritance. I bless you with the blessings promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I release God's favor over you. I speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you. Have a great day.